Thank you, guys. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Michael Roberts from uh, Nelson Mandela University uh, presenting Developing Marine Robotics uh, for the Western Indian Ocean Needs, Designs, and Applications. Dr. Roberts, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Is there a, a microphone? Or is, is there a here? Yeah, right. This is the mouse over here, right? Yeah. We, we, oh, this is, that's yeah. forward. The laser. The laser. Okay. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so I was going to introduce myself, but you've done the job. Thank you very much. Um, the second thing I want to say is have a little bit of pre a preface before I start my, my, my slideshow. Um, just saying that robotic meet meetings are usually about geekness. We tend to show the best and the fastest and the smartest machines, and we in introduce AI and all kinds of machine learning into the things. I want to take you down a different a different road for a while for what I've got 25 minutes or so and I want to show how in fact marine robotics are opening up and helping us solve probably one of the greatest humanitarian challenges on the planet and you will see when I start showing you a couple of slides how big this this crisis is but it really typifies the importance of a simple machine that engineers get quite excited about Playing around in a tank or something, where in fact it's going to affect millions of people's life, uh, millions of people's lives. So, before I start, having said that, I just want to introduce my other co-speaker, um, Dr. Andrew Young. He's an engineer. I used to be an oceanographer. I call myself now an ocean scientist because my my field has just opened up to encompass just about everything in in ocean science, marine science. So I've called my talk, Developing Marine Robotics for the Western Indian Ocean, Needs, Designs, and Applications, and I will talk to that. And I want to just say that, that Bert Jones, um, at the beginning of the session, had a very nice slide of the Western Indian Ocean. And I don't know if you'll remember, but he said we knew absolutely nothing about the Western Indian Ocean. So I'm going to start talking about that block. So a couple of slides to set the scene. And I realize that we've got a very diverse audience here. And so I know some of you know about climate change, but I was absolutely horrified yesterday that two people I spoke to didn't know where South Africa is. And I thought, wow, okay, maybe we pop in a couple of slides just to remind ourselves climate change. This is a plot, a graph of temperature over the last 1700 years. And it just illustrates I put this in because here we've got 1700 years, but you can see the climb in the ocean temperatures in the last hundred odd years or so. It is astronomical compared to any other time almost on the planet. And it's very soon that we're gonna reach this 1.5 global ocean temperature range, which is when doom and gloom is gonna be forecast. Just looking at the last 100 years, you can see the ocean is not heating up everywhere the same. Some places are heating up faster than others. If we take the Indian Ocean, the Western Indian Ocean that Bert was talking to, which by the way is only about 800 or 1000 kilometers down the road here from the Red Sea, we have a very special situation. Down here you can, whoops, down here you can, can you see that down here you have a warm pool of water in the Indian Ocean. And that is the black line showing you the last 100 years of how that ocean is heating. The red line is what's happening in the Western Indian Ocean. And so the story is that the Western Indian Ocean is heating up faster than just about anywhere else on the planet. What this does to those of you who are not oceanographers, it starts capping the food chain. So the phytoplankton, the grass, in the ocean equivalent. And then you get the moo cows eating the grass, exactly the same thing happens in the ocean. And so what's happening, very short graphs are showing us that as the temperature rises, that bottom picture over there on the right, the green graph is coming down. And so the ecosystems of the Western Indian Ocean are beginning to starve. Not only do we have a global warming, but we've got Enzo, you guys have all heard about El Nino, La Nina, you get these episodic absolutely huge warming events on top of it. 
And then I'm not even talking about marine waves, which are just like you have on the on in the atmosphere. You get those days that are really hot. People start dying in Italy and stuff. The same thing happens in in. So we really have got a serious situation here. If we now come to the human side of the Western Indian Ocean, and I, this is the Western Indian Ocean here, it includes nine countries of which most of them are DAC listed as low income. So when I say low income, 100 US dollars a year is actually quite a lot of money per family. This over here, uh, in this area here, we have an estimated of 60 million people who every day go to the beach like this. This is in Zanzibar. Okay, men and women, the men go out in boats, not boats with an engine on, okay, boats that you row or you sail, and they go and spend the whole day catching fish. They come back, and then those fish are divided amongst family members. If you are lucky, you get a big fish. That big fish goes to the hotel. It gives you some cash. You might get, if you're lucky, two or three US dollars, and you go and buy some maize and some st staples from that. This is the life that 60 million people in the Western Indian Ocean, 800 kilometers down the road, are living on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is how you go and have, go and do your shopping. Your food security is very far from the food security of these people. And so what's happening? We've got a situation where essentially we've got a humanitarian crisis that we are predicting is going to hit in about 10 years from now. What is going to happen is that there's going to be conflict for meager resources. There's not a lot of fish in the ocean right now. Climate change is impacting the systems. The systems are, systems are beginning to collapse. And what we're forecasting is that you're going to get competition. Competition for food is going to start causing strife. It's going to start calling, causing political uncertainty, and you're going to end up with migration. You've all heard this on the news, CNN, BBC, and everything. So what I'm trying to do is expose the situation to the world. It's a huge situation, but not many people are aware of it. And I hope very soon to be elevating this to UN status. Somalia is the first country to go. Thousands of tons of food are being flown in every single day. We're going to be flying in food to the western side of Africa, uh, the eastern side of Africa very shortly. The research program that I've been working on for the last seven years. What I've done is we've divided it up. We've got these white boxes on the right-hand side, and we look at basically the coral from space and everything. And we've come up with nine boxes that we think these are independent ecosystems that function differently. They comprise of different things. They're driven by different um, drivers. And so we've been working lately, well, the last seven years, on each one of these things, trying to characterize and understand them. An example here is Mozambique. This is Mozambique over here. This is Madagascar. There's Madagascar over there. This is Mozambique, 3,000 kilometer coastline. 40%, uh, uh, set, about 70% of the population live on the coast. who are very reliant on food. One of the tools we use, because it's very, very accessible. Some of you may or may not know this if you're not working in the marine world, but we use satellites every single moment of our lives. Everybody uses satellites. We, what we do is we take 20 years of data, that's as far as back we can go, and we start creating lovely plots like this. And in this one over here of these different boxes down here, we can see the ocean is warming from the satellites. It's only 18 years. Then what we, we try and do is we now try and forecast what this is going to look like in 80 years time. So for all the planners, for the, all the people out there, the politicians, they want to know the UN, what is it going to be like in 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 years time? That's what you're trying to do. The problem is, this is a Mozambique channel. This is a satellite image, and this is our very best computer models. We're not getting it right. So as of this year, we're starting a huge uh, collaboration with the European Digital Twin Ocean, trying to reset and be, get these models to be more accurate. The problem with the Western Indian Ocean, we almost never see a research vessel. If we're lucky, we get one every 10 years. And when we do get one from the FAO, UN, Norway, it's got such a restricted um, schedule that we can't do any research from it. So we actually don't have any ships in the, in the area. And so we are being forced to use, to get these observations that we need in the ocean. We're being forced now to use robots. 
And as all of you know in this room, there is a sleuth of machines on the market. You can get a machine just about, I mean, just these talks I've been listening to this morning, everyone's coming up with smarter ideas, okay, but there's one problem. These machines here cost minimum two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars. When you're talking about research institutions in the Western side, and I can talk for Africa, we're talking about an annual budget for research of three hundred thousand dollars. So the entire budget would go on buying one of these machines. Number two is is that the skill sets which we were talking about in one or two other talks are so advanced that the users, the scientists, can't use the machines very well. And the third point is the operational base to take that machine, to set it up, to maintain it, set it up and put into the water is so complicated that the institutions can't afford that. So we've got to rethink this problem. We've got 10 years to sort this thing out. And right now I spend my life going between governments and different societies, different institutions trying to find money and it's not that easy. So, so the only solution is we need to lower the cost and simplify a lot of this geek geekness. So with this, this whole sort of like panacea I've painted to you now is what I decided to do is that I've tried to get Western, in particular developed countries, to deploy machines. They will deploy the machines, but they go straight back to the University of Southampton or wherever it is. They deploy them for short times and I need huge amounts of money to be able to operate these teams. So in 2019, with the help of the National Oceanography Center in the UK and University of Southampton, I basically started off a marine robotics unit. So I'm standing here as a complete newbie into this whole topic. Um, and here's uh, just so that some of you know where South Africa is. Um, here's a map of, of Africa up there when this thing works. Oops, sorry, how do I get this thing to go backwards? Can you just reset it? Uh, let's, we can reset it here. Right, you got it? Yeah. So um, there's a map up there of Africa. This isn't work. Oh, there it's working now. And South Africa is down at the bottom for those of you who may not know. And this is the Nelson Mandela University where I spend a lot of my life and I've got a lab there at the moment. And we've just finished building a fairly impressive um, ocean science campus. And that's where we are strongly based from there. And then we work into the region from over here. We've got a small budget. Uh, the unit was started 2019. We've got two full-time engineers and six postgraduate students. We have a total budget of $1 million. We've had, we've still got a little bit of money left over. Okay, and the mission is to build cheap machines. Don't put on anything extra we need. Just let's keep it simple so everyone understands how to use it and we can buy these things. Okay, and then we want minimal technical skills. That's our mandate. Okay, so we started off and with our, our $1 million, we've got three prototypes. We've got a surface vehicle that there's hundreds of surf, surface vehicles floating around, a coastal glider. Now that's a little bit different because our coasts are very narrow, very shallow, 50 meters. You're not gonna get a slocum and a lot of these gliders operating in that water. They start in hundred meters. And then I, I wanna show you an aerial drone situation. That's quite, quite fascinating. So this now is a situation that we've got. Here is the satellite image, okay? And we need to zoom in where the people live. This, if you zoom into the Mozambique channel here, Madagascar, this is the Bazarutu archipelago, one of the most beautiful places on the planet. People spend thousands of dollars to go for holidays there. But the thing is, it's sand flats, channels, very shallow. The problem is, is that this place we suspect is heating up faster than maybe outside in the deeper ocean. And unfortunately, those of you know who are dugongs are, where are those hearts coming from? That's interesting. Uh, wow, okay. So, so the thing is, is that, uh, just a side note there is dugongs, they, they're gone. All the seagrass beds are beginning to disappear and it's quite sad to, to see this, but we need, Two things, we need to build a data set, a historical data set around this area, and we need to map that area. 
and you can't do it on a boat. Um, will this work now? I'm having a few challenges, it looks like. Let me try that. Is there maybe some interference going on? I had, ah, there we go. Okay, so again, cheapness. I've got a handful of students. I've got two engineers, all right, and budgets limited. So this is the thing we came up with. Okay, the criteria are really simple. Two men or women carry the thing to the beach. You need it as light as possible. So no fancy flipping echo sounders and stuff like that. Minimal batteries on board, save money. And the thing has cost us $2,500. You can put it on a car, you can drive it around. We drive thousands of kilometers to these, these places. We chuck it in a, on the beach and this thing goes off and it goes in maps. And that, uh, I'm not gonna show you all the That's the propellers I want to show you. Everyone shows that you. Okay, but now, so that's the one thing we started. The next thing now is this marine heatwave story is getting really serious. It's getting so serious that within 10 years, the entire Western Indian Ocean is going to be one massive heat wave. We've got to get in there to start. This is where the hot water is being made near Madagascar. We've got to get in there and start looking at how the biology is changing in these heat waves, because that's what's going to impact. The trouble is I've got no ships. There's absolutely no craft you can use in Madagascar. And I've got about 600 kilometers to get from this part of the continent to that bit of the water. So we came up with Mark II. This is lighter, faster. There's nothing special about this thing, but it works like crazy. It costs $2,500. You've got to put one or two sensors on. It's got a water sampler that's being made. By the way, a water sampler has to collect water samples for phytoplankton analysis and stuff. I went on the internet just instantly, and there's not a single one that I could find. So we built one for precisely $190. That's it. If you get out there, you can actually build stuff incredibly cheaply. Uh, uh, its cruise speed, by the way, is two and a half meters per second. So it's just some of the students. Look at the motors. These motors are for fish trucks, fishing for trucks. So there's a little boat for the guys to hold it. Motors cost about $200. That's enough of the movie. But here's something how you can become quite innovative. We need to get all the way out there, 800 kilometers, and back quickly before our samples in our little homemade um, water sampler start undergoing too much change. Because remember, they're full of biology. So this is what we're doing in a few months time in July, is that we're taking this craft and now this eddy, this area has got eddies in it. Now, for those of you who don't understand eddies, they're about 300 kilometers wide and they're massive swirling pieces of water. They go anti-clockwise and clockwise. This is almost one of the richest areas in the world. So just like the space scientists do, where you use planets to actually slingshot and accelerate your robots. We're using these things to basically build our speed up to five and a half meters per second. So by driving the thing into these eddies, we can add another two meters per second onto the speed of the boat, absolutely free. And if we want to park, we can, and because it's not quite right, we can put the thing into an eddy and it will just hold itself until we, we find a nice opportunity. And of course this stuff, we can see two, three months in advance what it's gonna look like. So it's an incredibly powerful tool. I'm actually quite excited um, about this. So right, now what I wanna do is just come to South Africa and a particular problem we've got here. As some of you may know, you have one of the most powerful currents in the world here, the Gullis Current. It travels at two meters per second, transports 120 million cubic meters of water per second. If it stops, the planet will lose some time. That's how much momentum is generated. But what comes with this is huge variance. This is this red here, this is satellite, this is temperature. You can see that the features here are just phenomenal. And these things are changing over 24 hours. This is a picture of the biology, the phytoplankton. What's happening is that 
within 24 hours, the situation has changed. The problem is when we relate back to satellite data, here is the satellite track coming over here. The satellite's flying fast, thousands of kilometers an hour. It's busy taking as over here, it's busy doing all its measurements from the uh, fluorescence uh, re reflectance and stuff. We need to know what's in the water that's causing that so we can track it over time. And I should just mention here in the audience that I have a postdoc here, Sixeli, who is just received her PhD. Where are you, Six? Are you here? There we go. Today is the first day that she starts her career in marine robotics. So I said, you got to come here and meet all the geeks. So, so this is Six's project here. She just got a PhD the other day. She's got a postdoc and everything, and she's going to be basically using robots to basically ground truth satellites and stuff. But the problem is, is how do we sample this so fast? So we came up a couple of years ago with this idea. You can see drones. You can't see it so clearly up here. A drone over here. We need to get 50 kilometers out to sea. Chop, chop, chop. And the drone needs to sort of fly out there, stop, hover, lower something into the water, bring it up, and then carry on. Everything. That was the dream. OK, so the engineers, engineering side, come up with this fellow here. This is the prototype. It's got a seven meter wingspan. It's six meters long. It's got six propellers. The ones at the top are battery driven. The ones in the front are petrol driven. And we had to put wings on it to get so far out, 50 Ks out. So what it does, it cruises, it saves energy, but when it hovers, it spins and it uses, it uses electric motors and it has to use quite a lot of um, power. The big motors use petrol. So it's a little bit heavy, but it, it can pick up 80, kilometers, uh, 80 kilos, which is what I wanted. I think this is prototype. That and we're not allowed to fly it because we still got That's as far as we've managed to get so far. We, we apparently, I'm told, got the papers and we can start going out and doing trials with it now. Hey, you get lots of aerial drones, but that whole thing cost, I think the thing costs about five and a half thousand dollars something, a machine that big. So the last thing then was coming back to what one or two people have spoken about is gliders. There's a sleuth of gliders out there. They all cost two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000, way beyond our budgets. The other thing is they generally start operating at, 10, at 100 meters. I need something that's going to start cruising around at 30 meters. So I went to the engineers. They came up with, we had some criteria. Uh, that little over there, for those of you not in the marine world, there's all kinds of flipping fancy gizmos out there. The Chinese have just brought out the Hayeli number two, which is very smart and everything. So this is the, the one we came up with, number one. And I looked at this, I said, look, guys, you need to go to the drawing board again. Go and have a look at what's out there. They did that. Um, this is now our new version. Okay. Um, I'm told by the engineers, because I'm not the engineer who designed the stuff, okay, is that it's got a very big bladder, bladder so we can control it. It's got AI, believe it or not, on board, so it can get really smart with this navigation. But it's, hey, the whole thing was made in the town, Port Elizabeth, where the university is. And I can't, we didn't have a lot of, by the way, the other thing I want to say is that the previous projects had huge student participation. This one didn't, it only had 10%. But basically, it's locally Lo locally made um this is i had to put just something in because you know i was just fascinated thing moved this is the engineers testing the role of, of the whole thing in the room but the important thing i want to say is that look at how much this thing costs hundred thousand dollars all components made locally the biggest cost is the software because the engineers cost us too much putting the ai and stuff the components all this stuff cost seventeen thousand dollars Okay, and talking to the engineers, they reckon they can knock this thing down out of the workshops for $10,000, as opposed to $300,000. You do have to put a few sensors on here, but it's got everything else, got echo sounders, the whole lot. This now, this is uh, my, my last slide. This is about four weeks ago off South Africa, just doing a test. They put it down onto 200 meters to do a water, a water test and everything. But I want to draw attention to the student 
who's over here not interested not interested she's supposed to be on this project but she's busy throwing up on the side of the boat okay so that is my story and um, it's a different story it's not a story that you normally see at at robotics workshops but again just to summarize is that this is a real real problem this is how marine robotics are going to make well they're not going to make a huge impact because I don't have the solutions to this huge challenge, but we certainly will be exposing the challenge to the world. We will have a workshop in probably February 2026. It's going to be a UN summit workshop. It will be held probably, it's either going to be in the New York or it'll be at the Nelson Mandela University. And Eric and Kaust is that one of the reasons I'm here is because we need to talk. Because I think the Red Sea is just a little bit away from the Western Indian Ocean. And, uh, and I think there could be some nice opportunities for collaboration here. So that is my message. Thank you very much, everyone.